Welcome to the Mind of Money. My name is Douglas Lodmel, and welcome to this special edition. Uh, I've asked Peter Campbell, my guest from the last show and market expert, to come back and explain something that I consider critical information. And that is what happened in the municipal bond market last week with the announcement of QE2. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about with QE, quantitative easing, I refer you back to the multi-part show that Peter and I did on the last Mind of Money. Um, we go into an extensive detail. Welcome back, Peter. Thank you, Douglas. Yes, thanks for coming. Um, this is critical, and I mean, this is so important to me and to my clients that I really wanted to do a special edition on nothing but this. Yeah. Um, would you mind if I started off just reading you something that I ran yeah, across on yeah, the internet? Yeah. Okay, listen to this. Um, or maybe it's just common sense that the $2.8 trillion municipal bond market itself should be considered junk, junk, junk bonds. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to have to ask you why they're saying this because um, with so many states and municipalities staring down record deficits and lower tax receipts, hey, not every governor has the fortitude of New Jersey's Chris Christie to cut spending. Then again, history could have been our guide that a day like this would come for an ETF like HYD. In the first half of 2010, municipal bonds underperformed treasuries due to, you guessed it, default speculation. Can you explain to me and um, my clients that are watching this that are holding municipal bonds what this means for us? Essentially, um, Mr. Bernanke uh, has, has announced in his uh, Washington Post diatribe that um, he, I think he did an op-ed there. Yeah. He said that quantitative easing had worked the first time to lower long-term rates and midterm rates, and he said it will work again this time. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is, is that it did just the opposite last time, and it's doing just the opposite this time. So you can't trust the words out of the government at this point. Okay, so uh, so how did that affect the bonds? I mean, what, well, how what, that affects bonds is that interest rates go up and your principal value goes down in, right. in a bond. So you get a discount. So essentially, you're going to have to hold that bond to uh, its maturity in order to get your full money. Okay, so now um, I'm glad you brought that up. There's a lot of my clients over the years that have bought municipal bonds um, at a peak of the yield curve type of pricing. So the, their bond um, selector would go out and pick the peak of the yield curve, usually 15 to 17 to 20 years out. Um, and then they would buy bonds, $10,000 at a time, and they would ladder them. And they've been doing that for years and years and years. And today they have a very nice, picture-perfect laddered bond portfolio, and they actually intend to hold to maturity. What, how does this affect them, if at all? Well, there's a very interesting sort of dynamic going on in the markets overall right now. Um, there's very extreme emotion and there's very extreme risk. The instruments that people buy may not be able to deliver on the covenants that they thought it would. By so the you're time talking about default. Maturity. Yeah. Okay, so holding maturity is fine if, if the bond I mean, doesn't default. In fact, the credit default swap rates, which is the insurance rates on Munis. municipal bonds have doubled in price okay. this year. Which tells you that the market, the Wall Street market that, that looks at bonds is considering munis more and more risky. Yeah, they're considering the fact that they will have to pay, in order to give insurance, they're going to charge twice as much. Now what about these bonds that are insured or they're general obligation bonds? Um, are they still seriously at a risk for, of default? What we're seeing are, are tectonic shifts going on. Okay. Um, there are default risks coming up for sovereign debt. Yeah. So when we're talking about municipal debt, that's a way lower level of debt. Right. The, the Pima County is, is, is um, not any stronger than the sovereign nation of Greece, for example. Yeah, I mean, exactly. you really can yeah. compare these and say that municipalities are capable of defaulting just like a sovereign country is. Yeah. And the, fa the, the fact is it's happened before. Okay. So it's not entirely new. Well, there's another thing that I'm looking at now is that um, over, the, over the last 20 years, as I've been watching clients buy bonds and I've been watching the, the, the bond market through their eyes, um, in many ways it had made a lot of sense um, because of the where interest rates were and the fact that they were, on, in general, kind of marching lower and lower and lower. The bond uh, yields were going down, but then again the premium pricing was going up. And, and for many of those years, we had five percent municipal bonds, five and a half percent. It was really pretty good. Tax-free, that made a lot of sense. Um, today, the, 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 
um, just even if we're not talking about default, I don't really see the advantage of holding them in this bond. I well, mean, if the, treasuries are outperforming them. We have to ask ourselves them, a fundamental question. Why did, the, why did we create so many incentives for people to get into the, these bonds? We, we created tax incentives. We yeah. created all sorts of mechanisms to try to get people into this. And if you heard the uh, general um, attitude on Wall Street this year, everybody and their brother was setting up a municipal bond pumping operation. In fact, Goldman Sachs mm -hmm. um, created an entity just to promote these ultra-safe, as they called them, investments. Okay. And as we can see, it's not quite so ultra-safe. I think we should take a look at a few charts sure, here. Yeah, Firstly, we should take a look at um, what did happen during the the crash in uh, uh, 2008. Okay, this is December 2008, right yep. there. So, all basically, in the course of three, and in one course of one quarter, we had, uh, in in principal value, we had, you know, an utter crash in this particular bond fund, which is the Pimco California bond fund, um, which essentially was unfathomable. It's still unfathomable to me that that could actually happen. Right. But it did, and <laughs> if we go to look at this chart, we see that I drew a trend line across there. I'm just trying to show that we have broken a psychological support level. Uh, with this here, you mean? Yeah, with this last move, which coincided exactly with the, with the QE2. QE2 announcement on uh, November 9th. Okay. So exactly what you would expect, and I still hear people on the radio talking about it. They say, you know, why should people invest in this and that and the other thing when they know that quantitative easing is coming and the government's printing dollars and the dollar is going to go down? Right. Do, do, you, do you see that happening in that chart? I don't see that happening in that chart. I see <laughs> the opposite happening. Yeah, well, this is what we talked about in the, in the more extended interview, which if you haven't seen, please, please take the time to watch that because it was fascinating and we got into such depth there. But one of the real important points from that interview was that um, even though ultimately we're debasing our currency, the short-term effects and the medium-term effects are that the dollar is likely to get very, very valuable because there's few of them on the street. Yeah, and I think when we look at some of the other charts that I brought along here, we'll be able to see that there's a psychological predisposition for people because of how much energy they have put into this hyperinflation idea. You're right. One of the main things that if you look at 1929 and you look at 2009, mm -hmm. what, let's talk about the things that are similar. Okay. We had had large bubbles yep. that came into those marketplaces. And it was jet, very jet fueled similar. bubbles. Jet fueled bubbles, and I mm -hmm. want to identify it very clearly. The real estate bubble topped one and a half to two years earlier than the stock market did in 1929. Okay. It's exactly the same as what happened here. Uh -huh. We had real estate top in roughly the 2005. Oh, you're saying in 1929, real estate topped one and a half to two years earlier yeah. than the stock market topped yeah. and before it crashed. Yeah. And then we had um, the same thing happen virtually here in 2005, 2006. Real estate was on a tear uh -huh. um, and the stock market continued to build not a new high per se, mm -hmm. um, if you measured it like in the form of the NASDAQ or if you measured it in uh, the actual purchasing power of the, of the stock market. But, but on a nominal level, in dollar terms, um, we had new highs on yeah. the Dow and, and the S&P 500 and on the Wilshire, which is the largest, which is all the United right, States. Before, stocks before this, you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So that is a very similar thing. So we had a tremendous amount of debt that was taken on to trade, to mm -hmm. speculate. Yeah, margin debt in, margin in debt. the 29 crash. And this was the beginning of a process which was being expanded um, whereby the uh, Federal Reserve started playing and tinkering with the process of issuing money mm -hmm. through lending. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, you know, margin was one of the ways that they did that. Right. Um, now, Is it safe to say that in 1929, the Fed had only been in existence since 1913, and they were they were trying they were experimenting. Yeah, they were experimenting, and in the 1920s was when they really started to get going. And they and they started to create money through this yeah. mechanism of lending, and they started, if, am I right, 
that they started the lending mechanism inside of the exchange by creating margin accounts. Yes, exactly. And ten that's what one, that's what one created one. the the, the yeah, bubble because exactly. all of a sudden people, I mean, which if everybody watching this can just get this simple point, if you flood the market with credit, and it's probably easier to see in the housing bubble of of this last decade than it is to see in 1929, but if you flood the market with easy money then it's just, of course, prices just keep going up because everybody can get the loan and the payments are basically not accurate to the amount of money because they're deferred and they're, they don't really start till later. A bubble's created. Same thing happens if you do it in the market. Yeah. People don't get that, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, that's a big part of the marketplace. The other thing that is, uh, is important to realize is now what the differences are. So we have quite a bit of common okay. thread. Yeah. Now, the other thing that is just, just mesmerizing for me is that when you go back and you look at the Depression, uh -huh. everybody and their brother was saying, you know, essentially the dollar is going to collapse, this whole thing is a, is a disaster, mm -hmm. and it was the same attitude. And do you know what the dollar did? It went. It did nothing but go up. Right, because there were no dollars on the street. Exactly. And so everybody needed in, them. Yeah, people needed them to, when they were selling stock, so they needed real dollars. They needed dollars somebody earned, not somebody that somebody got from credit. Yeah, this is this is really interesting because it's very counterintuitive, and all I hear right now is inflation talk. Every blog, every talking head, they're all saying we're debasing our currency, we're printing money. It's going to cause inflation, and everybody just assumes that. That's the next step for us, yeah. but but the reality is it's 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 it long term it will, but short and mid term it won't. It'll create a, an increase in the value of the dollar and deflation in the inflationary assets. I wrote a piece on my blog. The fact is, is we had a a breakout line uh, on the indexes, which were in the stock market indexes, mm -hmm. which were very important lines. This was a very important level. Um, because over that level, everybody would believe, most investors would believe, it's time to go along. And they would also say, wow, this is going to be hyperinflation. We've got to be in stock assets. Mm -hmm. Over that line, this is very dangerous. We have to be long. And what you mean by that is that if you think there's inflation, you want to be an inflationary asset like, like, a, like stock, a stock. Yeah, exactly. So that your money is yeah, exactly. maintained. Yeah. So, but what that line for me was was a different line. It wasn't the same as what everybody was saying. Mm -hmm. Basically, this was the ending well line, as I called it. Mm -hmm. So if we crossed that line, what it meant was Ben Bernanke and the Federal Reserve and the government had all agreed that it was more important for them to inflate assets rather than to empower the um, average American to be able to afford to live still Mm -hmm. and to afford to have a job. Because one of the problems that happens when inflation hits, especially in the, when it's manipulated inflation like this, um, is, is that assets like commodities will go very, very high. And I'm mm -hmm. going to show a few of those. Mm -hmm. um, and those increase the costs of production for companies in virtually every business. Yeah, sure. And so that means they have less money to pay for employees. Yeah. That means that when an employee is trying to go to work, it's more expensive. That means when they're trying to buy food for their family, it's more expensive. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, is that any company in the right mind who sees that all these expenses are going up, but they don't have a consumer who's also, you know, getting more demand. They have a consumer who's going to demand less. They say, wait a second, this isn't going to work. How can I have, I've got all these employees, all these consumers, they all have less money unless they own stocks or, or um, commodities. And the only people who own stocks and commodities really are banks mm -hmm. or very wealthy people. Mm -hmm. um, so the company's gonna say, wait a second, I have to cut back. I can't, I can't function in this business. Right. So, so the fact is, is that Ben Bernanke came out and said, it's more important for me to make banks have good looking balance sheets by inflating the assets on those balance sheets than it is to make sure that people can have jobs and that they can continue to work and afford things and companies can afford to pay So them. he's really putting the um, apparent health of the financial system above the fundamental health of, of, of the economy itself. Exactly. And so, so the result of that is any businessman in his right mind is going to say, I don't trust this thing. I'm going to pull back and I'm going to wait until this whole thing is clear. Yeah, it makes sense. And I'm going to also, you know, not I'm going to not borrow if I can. Cut salaries. I'm not cut going to salaries, borrow. Cut spending. Cut employees. Okay. The depression correlation 
we did we, we didn't just discuss totally was the um, differences. The big difference between us now and mm -hmm. 1929, we had a lot of similar problems. We had a debt collapse. We had all these other things we talked about, but we had a stock market collapse. But what we didn't have was second mortgages. Mm. We didn't have credit cards. We right. didn't have $720 trillion we didn't have derivatives. Ha household debt. We didn't have, you know, government deficits. We yeah. had surpluses. We had trade surpluses. And we had manufacturing capability mm. in the United States. We weren't outsourcing all our jobs. So when it came time, push to shove, you could still say to somebody, I'm going to cut your salary in half, but you still have the same buying power because the prices of everything are in half. Mm -hmm. And you know you, you could work your way out of it. What's different with us now is that we have all these other headwinds additionally. In a recession, prices go down because demand goes down. And that's good because people can afford to buy <laughs> You things. want a little deflation during a recession of yeah. your real uh, assets or, or the real commodities that we need to, to drink every day, milk yeah. and sugar yeah. and gas. And, and, and it's also, it forces innovation. It's a good mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. The government and Ben Bernanke are actually saying, we need to get those prices up. Right, to make the balance sheets of the banks look better. Well, that's the only reason I can come up with. Right. Um, we need higher prices of all these things in a, in a recession. It doesn't make any sense. That's like saying what we want is to make the recession more. <laughs> we want to make a stronger recession mm -hmm. uh, rather than a weaker one. If we mm -hmm. have low prices, it gives people a chance to renew. It gets the concept going where the competent people mm -hmm. get the assets and the incompetent people lose them. And yeah. then you can refresh and rebuild. And, and, and at this moment in time, the incompetent are the banks. Yeah. Exactly. They're the incompetent yeah. people. And, yeah. the, and the, 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 the fraud, which is existent in all the debt markets right now, mm -hmm. and I'm including the municipal bond market, because there's a lot of fraud and misrepresentations in those markets. I can only imagine. Yeah. Um, so those things are not yet hit. They have not come out yet. We are seeing it a little bit with this, uh, you know, um, foreclosure gate thing that's going on. But we haven't begun to really see how, how, how deep that goes. And those things are going to affect the, ta affect the tax revenues dramatically of all of these municipalities. Yeah, I mean, my just common sense says right now would be a nice time to get out of your municipal <laughs> bond portfolio. And I'm not a financial advisor, I'm a lawyer, and um, you know, I don't hold municipal bonds, but just my common sense says, why be in that particular market? It's a debt-based instrument in a debt bubble. That's enough for me. Yeah, I think that that's, the objective for me here isn't to, isn't to tell people what to do. I, I did have a few suggestions on some things that are very safe that mm -hmm. you know that you can do to kind of just say I'm staying out of this. Right. Let me set this out. Um, but the thing is, is the most important thing is, is that we can have a discussion which just makes people think. It's the, the time to think is not after; it's before. Right. And, and we are, what, are we still before. Yeah. We're, we're still, still before, before right now. It may not feel like it when you see that chart. But yeah. It's, but we're still before. And there's another thing, which is, is that psychology is a very important thing. And what I've done when in, in trading before, everybody falls into this trap, is you want to buy at the low and you want to sell at the high. Yeah. Or you want to sell at the high and you want to buy at the low. Um, the problem is, is that that's, a really, um, that's not practical. Um, you need to think practically. And when you have a situation where you don't know what to do and no answer seems to be good, you have to trust yourself and do something. Right. Don't so, just do what you always have done in this case, which is basically just so, stay in your market, yeah, stay so, in your munis. Yeah, so if, if I'm trying to sell at a high, and I'm not sure if that is the high that I just, that just got hit in price, then the best thing for me to do is to say, I'm not sure, but I'll sell something. I'm going to do something rather right. than do nothing. And that keeps your psychology good so that when you get to another point where you have a bad decision to make because you didn't act enough, you still feel like I did something, I was proactive. Mm -hmm. So my thinking here is just, let's show that there's some problems, let's show that there's a lot of pent up emotional problems in the marketplaces, and then just everybody should think. It's a checkpoint, think. Yes. Call people, think. call your financial advisor. Uh, call your bond broker. And when, they give you, when they, and when they give you an answer that just does not add up, 
do something. Ask, Don't listen yeah. to an answer that doesn't add up and say, oh, you know, it's just the same old thing I've ever heard. Then say, wait a second. It's better for me to do something rather than, uh, maybe I'll take that into consideration, but I'll do something too. I'll sell something or right. whatever. Right. Um, so anyway, let me, let me um, go on to this. So that's a pretty bad looking chart, what you can see over there. Um, and this is an interesting view. Um, essentially, what we can see is for very many years, the municipal bonds market was stable. It was very stable. And so you didn't really This is the muni bond market as a whole. Yes. Okay, and this, this, this line right here is, just so we're clear again, this is uh, the fourth quarter of 2008. Yep. And so, um, basically, this was a trading range for those bonds, of between mm -hmm. 16 and, say, 13 and a quarter, for roughly, say, probably 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, it, it may have been longer. I didn't do an analysis longer. I just wanted to sh demonstrate that. We broke out of that range. And um, the characteristic for markets is that they retest ranges. Mm -hmm. This was, we broke out and crashed essentially. And everybody was wondering, when are all these muni bonds going to default? The other thing they were wondering about was muni bond insurance, which was through AMBEC and MBI, MBIA. Right. And that was another reason that this happened, because people realized the insurance wasn't any good. Mm -hmm. And um, then we had this huge rebound, and I have, written a, a, an analytic that, um, that puts these little lines on the charts automatically and it basically said, hey, bearish rally here. Okay, so um, for, for, for somebody who's been holding munis and they held through that, in one sense you could say, hey, I was, I was really, you know, it was fine. I went through 2008. Uh, could it really be worse than that? And uh, my, my portfolio recovered, I'm fine. Again, I was not scared out of it, I didn't do anything rash, and I now have a, still my same bond portfolio. I, is there something different here than, than here? Yes, because okay. the usual scenario is, is that with almost everything human, we have the shot across the bow. Mm. And then you have the, the real war, shot, okay. the war. So the battle so this starts was the shot after across the, the bow. shot across the bow. And well, so the risk is that that's the case now. now I hope it's not. I hope that, that, that this whole thing can just resolve itself nicely and printing right. money works and mm -hmm. um, telling people that you're going to do something that's going to make interest rates go down but actually makes them go up, that, that in, there's some altered reality where everybody says oh, that makes me confident and happy. Right. Creating inflation in, uh, in the commodities that we need to live during a, a, a time of recession is, is going to work somehow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all these counterintuitive, yeah. uh, non-logical things. Well, so here's I, I hope it all works. But the warning thing right now is that we have gone through a very big sideways move, yeah. move for, for th markets were stable for a long period of time, yeah. and we had this very jarring situation and now, in one week, we broke some what are called technical patterns here with this technical trend line, and then mm -hmm. you know my cycle indicator here, which is showing. Well, us the one that thing that, that my untrained eye notices here is that this line is definitely way out of whack with even this recovery line here. The rest and of these charts. There's one other thing that we should take a look at is that if you look down here, you'll see a large amount of volume. Yeah. Uh, on, so there was there was quite a lot of selling going on you know, in these markets. I didn't include volume in this chart, I probably should have, but... The, so know, basically when, when QE2 was announced, people said, I want to get out of my bonds. Well, when QE2 was announced, people say there's more risk in debt and I need higher interest rates. They need you to pay me more interest. Yeah. And think about it, that's only rational. If there's a higher risk, risk of default, you should pay more money Which for discounts it. your bonds, which exactly. means your bond portfolio after QE2 just got less valuable. Exactly. Okay. How much less as a that depends on what you hold right now this is the um, this is the PIMCO general bond fund uh -huh. municipal bond fund and as you can see we basically are probably down about 12 percent or something like that right it's a, quite it's a, a lot 12 percent um, you know I, I, how much can it be it can be a lot it can mm. be a lot I don't know you know how all the mathematics is going to work out for for people's individual portfolios, or even mm -hmm. specifically here, I'm my I don't invest in municipal bonds myself. I'm not interested in them. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the bubble. Mm -hmm. um, I want to show another um, 
uh, bond fund. This is another PIMCO bond, municipal bond fund. Yeah. Um, and what we can see here is a very beautiful technical pattern. This is called a descending triangle that occurred before the market fell apart um, in 2008. And then we set up this very weak bear flag. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm showing this is because this is a, uh, um, I believe, um, this is a weekly chart as opposed to a monthly, so you don't see all the history there. And you can see the technicals a little bit better, but in this fund, we set up this, this, this very weak rebound. Um, mm -hmm. And they call that a bear flag? Yes. yes. Meaning you're in a bear market, but we have a little flag up? Yep. Okay. Yeah. For somebody who's not holding a fund, who they're holding individual municipal bonds, then it, some will be much worse and some will be better. Okay. Depending on but it's going to be going. still similar to this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, what I want to show you is a little bit of what was being said in 2007 and 2008. Mm -hmm. um, now, I remind you that the Goldman Sachs of the world have come out and really started pumping Munis. municipal yeah. bonds. This has Makes been saying this safe <laughs> investment, the ultra safe. In fact, yes. on CNBC, that, that they've been using the ultra safe word. I mean, a few mm -hmm. times. And Bloomberg had some articles, you know, which referenced economists and uh, analysts referring to the ultra safe investments versus the not so safe, risky investments mm -hmm. like stocks. Right. Yeah. Now, the reality is, is um, that this is another example. Over here, uh, the Charles Schwab Yield Plus Fund says, this was in their words, provides higher yields on your cash with only marginally higher risk um, and therefore could be a smart alternative to money markets or treasury bonds. Mm -hmm. Now, if you invested in this bond, then you would, and then this bond fund, then you would see that essentially on a principal level, uh, firstly, there were a couple things that happened. When you, 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 a lot of bonds defaulted, so you, they never paid, and mm -hmm. uh, the result is essentially that you're only gonna get about less than 50% of your capital back. Mm -hmm. And this bond is still trading. Mm -hmm. I mean, this fund is still trading. So this was upwards of $10 here, and then now it's under five. Yes, yeah. and people took it seriously, and they thought it was safe, mm -hmm. and they thought, okay, well, this is going to be okay. And so what I'm looking for is where is the bounce here? Mm -hmm. And auction rate come. securities were the same thing. Huh. Now, the problem here is, is that a lot of these bonds will just get no bid at some point in the future if the market seizes up. So it will be very similar to an auction rate security. The insurance will fail, mm -hmm. and the bid will be gone on a lot of securities. Some will still be bid, but uh, you, know, the, you, you may very well find that you go to, go, go to the market and you can't get anything. So if someone, let's say they live in California, and therefore they bought all of California uh, munis because they wanted the double tax exemption from both yeah. Cal State and federal, um, would you consider that more risky than someone who had bought munis and they were in a tax-free state like Florida anyway and they bought them all over the country? I would, yeah, um, and I, I would say that there's just a, a very simple rule, and then we talked about this extensively, there are no shortcuts. Mm -hmm. When somebody is giving you a lot of nothing, mm -hmm. they're giving you a lot of like bonus stuff that is really nothing to try to entice you into, into doing, making a decision, especially with your investments, um, it's probably got some ulterior motive. So if somebody is giving you double tax-free um, got some ulterior motive. So if somebody is giving you double tax-free uh, bonds, then they're really desperate for your money. Well, they're just, they live in California and California is going to tax munis unless they're California munis. No, That's, exactly. Yeah. But that means California is really desperate to get the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so, so the reality is, is I think people need to, in this day and age, look and say, is there something that doesn't make sense? Yeah. If there's a government program that's trying to get you to be risky with your money and they're explaining you don't have to worry about it because you get a tax write-off, that is an enticement. Not only that, but you've got all your eggs in one basket in that case. It's now, all in California. And if California, uh, which we already know is a complete budget crisis, if they don't get this fixed, which I'm not quite sure how they're going to, nobody can balance the budget there, yeah. 
um, then there's going to be defaults. I mean, it's pretty much inevitable. You, yeah, you can't. You, you, they're back to writing IO, writing IOUs now. So. Yeah, they're literally writing IOUs for uh, government employees and for. Uh, I mean, it's it's insane. Now, the thing that's other the other thing that's interesting over here, which I remember, I had friends coming up to me um, back in 2007, and they were talking about these Citibank and HSBC and all these other mm -hmm. large banks who were issuing these risk-free investments in which you could earn a large amount of upside, right, no downside. but you would have no downside because they were supposedly yeah, able to manage them, that Yeah, they called them equity index funds. It's really some type of insurance, yeah, right? Uh, yeah, it was, it, it, again, this is, if you remember what happened in 1987, uh -huh. it was insurance that caused the market to go to collapse. It was uh -huh. this portfolio insurance concept. Uh, and Everything that we're doing right now, derivatives are insurance. They're insurance contracts, as I said in the meeting last time. But insurance companies like no, that are that are like are AIG can't companies. possibly go bankrupt. Well, <laughs> but the most important oh, AIG thing, did go bankrupt. <laughs> but the, the most important thing is we think banks are banks, but they're insurance companies. Right, they're right. The walls have been torn down, and so now we, they're uh, all. Uh, Citigroup is the largest of, I mean, financial conglomerate in the world, and it's both. It's Citigroup, it's insurance, it's travelers, it's it's all of it. Yeah, the, the, so, so this, this is a very you know, interesting uh, time. And uh, what I want to show is now the emotional underpinnings that are making everybody think that this market is going to, for example, behave this time, it's different. Yeah, right. Style. Everybody loves that. This so time it's, it's different. This story. time it's different, and it's going to go hyperinflation, and all these things are going to happen. Yeah. And we have to be in, uh, you know, interest rates are going to go to below zero, all mm -hmm. this other stuff, you know. And maybe. Effectively, interest rates are below zero in a yeah, lot of ways. Yeah, I think they but, are, right? But, but the reality is people were still buying into the idea that long-term rates could go lower and all this stuff could happen, and right. I don't see how that makes any sense. But let's take a look at the thing called a parabola. Okay. Now, a parabola is this arc, which I drew on this uh, screen. And what, what we have here is the weekly chart of silver. Okay, and... A parabola is a very interesting thing because it's an emotional statement. Mm -hmm. It tends to happen in commodities much more than it does in stocks, although it does happen occasionally in stocks when you get a whole bunch of people short. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so. And a lot of emotion comes in where people are saying, essentially, I'm going to go broke unless I get this thing now. Mm -hmm. uh, or I have to have this. It's absolutely necessary for my life mm -hmm. or for my business. That's a different Hence, story. when you're going yeah. short, you yeah. have to have it to cover. So yeah. yeah. Um, but in the stock market, who needs a stock? I mean, it's an option. It's right. it's, it's, it's optional. That's not an option. A stock is optional. Right. In some cases, it is an option. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but in any case, here, uh, these are you know more or less commodities, and people will go bankrupt if they can't get them. The whole business will stop. Right. Okay. Um, silver has that cap capacity more than gold. Right, because it's more he, industrial. People yeah. actually use silver for stuff. Yeah. Here, yeah. here we're seeing a parabola. Now, this is a highly emotional state for mm -hmm. people to be in. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are losing a lot of money, and other people who have no idea what they're doing are making a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe some of those people know a lot of what they're doing. For example, Jim Rogers may be selling right out at the top there, having made quite a bit of mm -hmm. cash. Now, the thing is, is we also know something else, that you know, J.P. Morgan, for example, had the largest single short position in silver. They're not supposed to have that. When? Now? They, they had it up to a couple months ago. I don't know what their number is now, but they're, they getting, sold it. they're getting prosecuted for it, for market manipulation. Okay. okay. Um, the central banks and the, uh, the general banking system does not want super high prices for gold and silver. Mm -hmm. um, so they got uh, squeezed here. And so that's a big part of actually. But wait a second, Morgan Stanley was short up to a few months JP ago. Morgan. Or JP Morgan. That means they, they were short as the market was going mm -hmm. up and yeah, up and up yeah, and up. Yeah. 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 So, so they were expecting it to crash. Well, they've been short for years. Okay. They, these are long term short positions. I see. The, the point really is, is that if you look on their balance sheet, you won't see, the, you won't see them properly explain the impact of that short. Right. You, you still see that J.P. Morgan earned $4 billion. Mm -hmm. And they did most of that by moving their loan reserves and saying, well, we don't need so many loan reserves right now. We're going to take $2 billion and say we don't need them for reserves anymore, and that'll be called profit. Right. So again, 180 degrees of what you would expect. Somebody should earn money to call it profit. In it's interesting case, that J.P. Morgan is reporting $4 billion of earning, and they produce nothing. Yeah. 
In fact, yeah. <laughs> what's still interesting about our economy is that the financial sector is still around about 40% of the entire economy. Now, these people are supposed nothing. to make their income off of helping the manufacturers and the com companies and the creators and the producers and the small businesses in the United States. How can they be equal, essentially, to that entire you know, the, right, because the, you know? the, the, the machine is taken over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but so we have a parabola. Now, where would I think that parabola would end? If parabolas go in the way which I will show later, they don't end well. The other side of this line is never pretty. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, this could continue higher, mm -hmm. but where would it likely go? Mm -hmm. Well, it would likely go down over here to about $4.90 mm -hmm. or so, $5.00. Um, and let's take a look at another para parabola, sugar. So we have this beautiful parabola, and sugar collapsed. Look how much that collapsed. Wow. That is a disaster. This was after QE2 or this was This earlier? was all on QE2. This is all from, this is a week, these are, these are charts all related to just after QE2. There was a little pop in this stuff actually after QE2, I think, that, uh, so we're talking about over the, right, you know, there, about a week ago. So we had two or three days of stability after QE2 and then bang. You know, we're talking about from 34 to 26. That's a huge move. Yeah, that's a huge move. And what you're saying is, you know, what are they going to say when it's down to 10? Yeah, and actually, Let's go back to this previous one because the press is saying silver can go, has much higher to go. Apparently, there is a shortage. There's not enough silver. Now, okay, I agree that the, the banks are playing with derivatives and so they actually are selling more silver than exists, but they sell more dollars than exist as well. Right. So, um, this is, you know, they naked short anything they can get their hands on. Or can't get their hands on. <laughs> yeah, or can't get their hands on. Um, but the, the point is, is that, that, that we have, you know, a dangerous situation um, because everybody says, we're going to run out of silver. Okay, now let's take a look at the last time somebody said that. Here, remember that? Peak oil. We are going to run out of oil. Al Gore, promotion of cap and trade and the carbon exchange ideas reaches a pinnacle. Right. $180 for crude oil. This, right. this particular contract with crude oil, and I think the, there's other ones that were only made it to 160 but this, uh, this particular crude oil, which is the one that I actually do trade, uh, made it to 180 Now, take a look at where it went. This is what happens on the other side of a parabola. Right. So we went from a shortage to what, what the hell do I do with all this extra oil that I bought right. over here? Yeah. So, so that's the point. People are going to go back with their sugar and say, well, what do I do with all that sugar I bought up here and I can't use? So what are they, it's gonna, they're going to do that after it breaks this low mm -hmm. because they're just going to, I give up. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. and this kind of stuff is very destabilizing. It causes more instability, more insolvency, more bankruptcy, more distrust of the financial system. Here's what I'd like to say. If you're watching this and you're holding municipal bonds, we don't have anything to sell you here. We, we, we don't have a, an agenda for you. Um, I know my personal agenda is your safety and your financial safety. And um, listen to what we're saying and go ask questions. Go ask your own questions about what this means. And what I heard you say, which I would reiterate and I cannot agree more with, is that um, if you're not getting answers that really make sense to you and that you don't understand, then don't accept them as final answers and keep asking questions. Right now, if it were me and my money, I'd get in my Muni's, all of them, personally. That's a personal statement, not, not a recommendation. I would personally be out of Muni's completely. I'd be out of any fixed income product, any kind of bond. Um, and I would simply put all my money in treasuries and just wait this out. And, and the important point is it's short-term treasuries. The reason is that if you go into long-term treasuries, rates are going to be going up. Right, so Interest you're going to get a principal hit, so just a short-term short three-month treasuries. Yeah, and the best thing to do is to buy them directly, right. Treasury Direct or but something If like you that, have them know. with Treasury Direct, then there is no intermediary default risk. So no. if you hold them with uh, JP Morgan and JP Morgan has a problem, are your treasuries still safe? 
they're not as safe. They're not as safe. So they could get mixed in with assets it's of less JP likely, Morgan. But it's, it, it's less, there's not supposed to do that, but it's, 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 you, you don't, can't why say, bother? Why bother? Yeah, you cannot. Just go Treasury Direct. Yeah. I mean, we don't know a lot about these companies and the, you know, the accounting, I just want to make one other example. Um, the Federal Reserve took uh, the Bear Stearns project and got JP Morgan to get the creme de la creme assets mm -hmm. from Bear Stearns. It, you know, managed to negotiate that whole deal and in exchange it took, you know, some huge amount of assets which it took responsibility for and paid for. Now the idea, the thing is, is the Fed's supposed to only take really high quality assets. Mm -hmm. They took all the crap. They had to because JP Morgan wouldn't take it. Right. And the the thing is, is that part of that portfolio was called Maiden Lane. Yes, I remember this example. Okay. And that portfolio was made up of, guess what? Primarily hotel debt. Right. Okay, now. Which was we, we, zero. Was zero. You know, we know, and for example, Red Roof Inn was one of the, right. one of the, the know, assets, assets in there. Yeah. And they, uh, they had several, you know, defaults. Yeah. Now, they value that holding. At, they valued it at $62 billion uh, last year. This year, they valued it at $67 billion. Oh. They, they don't explain how they arrived at right. that. And they don't actually show these things exactly on their balance sheet unless they get sued right. by Bloomberg, who then says, you know, you got to show us what these assets are, what happened in that Bear Stearns thing, right. basically, which is what they did. Um, and uh, so this, the, the Fed was very reluctant to show this. And then when they did their accounting, of course, all these instruments don't trade. So right. we don't know what they're worth. Right. And yeah. they put magic numbers down. Of course. So should we, so they're giving that example and saying, well, Mr. Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan and Bank of America and all these guys, this is the way you do your accounting. It's fine. And we'll go help you by, you know, getting the financial FASB, financial standards and whatever right. it is Which board. Which is morphing every, to, every week to accommodate the banks and make sure they don't, they don't become insolvent. So. so now the point is, this flows straight through to the accounting for municipal bonds and for other stuff. The only reason short-term treasuries are a little bit different is because they are actually the currency of the nation. Right. Um, the, 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 the treasury is the denomination of the currency as close as we can get we it to the real tender issue. We have legal tender laws yeah. and therefore that will always be accepted at face value because of those legal tender laws. And when the government decides to default on those, mm -hmm. if they decide to default on them, which they probably won't, they'll just devalue just the dollar. Debase the currency. Um, they, that will be a very, very dangerous situation um, and we will know it. Uh, because we'll probably have some sort of conflict related to it. So these are all very, you know, there's going to be a lot of emotion here. And I showed you the charts which show you that there's a lot of emotion in these markets right now. Well, Peter, I really appreciate you coming back and talking specifically about this. Um, again, if you're holding municipal bonds, the message is go ask questions. Um, find your own answers. Make sure that you understand exactly what's going on and that you're comfortable. And if you're not, you know, set it out. Why, why, why be in uh, something that you're not absolutely sure about? Um, so I really appreciate you coming and uh, hopefully this has been helpful to you. Um, we said like, uh, you'll be back soon. I didn't realize this soon, <laughs> <laughs> but it was critical and it was important. Um, thank you for joining us on this special edition of The Mind of Money. My name is Douglas Lodmel and we'll see you next time.